Folks, um, tonight we're reaching a milestone. It's our last class on proposal writing, and next week to end the class, we will get to re proposal reviewing. So that you guys, you know, the, the beautiful thing about the last part of this class is that you guys will work on rewriting and rewriting and rewriting your proposals, just like we've been talking about um, <laughs> for the whole class, it feels like, right? I hope you guys are feeling good about the fact that you submitted your first full draft of your proposal. Um, don't worry if you feel like you still have a long way to go. That is the way these projects work. Um, sometimes you've got to get your first draft done so that you can realize what your next draft will look like. So you guys um, remember to go back to those videos on rewriting sentences, paragraphs, sections, um, if you need some inspiration about what the next steps would be. But we very much hope in these last four lectures that you guys will take advantage of the breakout sessions to really make those proposals great. Okay, so um, today we have two last kind of writing, I'm not sure we even call them writing projects. They're more like um, documents generating projects. Of non-scientific writing, right? Non, okay, yeah, thank you, Ed. See, much, much more um, technically appropriate. The non-scientific writing sections of your proposal. And these are um, um, parts of the proposal that are very important for the, um, funding agency, or in your case, your candidacy exam people to, um, to get to know you a little bit. Um, the, first, um, the first topic will be how to write your CV. And this is certainly true for candidacy exam. I would strongly encourage all of you to submit a CV along with your prospectus and your independent proposal. So you would submit three documents to your candidacy exam committee when you um, meet with them um, next winter. Um, but beyond your candidacy exam, of course, a CV or resume is something that you'll need to prepare for any job prospects that you have. And so I wanna talk about the CV and kind of what you should have in it, but I want you to understand that this is just a, it's a beginning for you to be generating that resume that you want to be proud of to give to an employer someday. It's important that you start writing this resume now. I know you may say to yourself, oh, I'm at the beginning of my graduate career. My resume isn't very long yet. Well, it's important though that you look to see what you have in that resume so you can start identifying what you want to add to it, okay? So, I would say writing your CV or resume early in your career and updating it as you accomplish the goals that you set out for yourself is a great way to structure your PhD and make sure that you're accomplishing the goals that you need to. Okay, so a CV is a great way to organize your PhD program. So let's talk about the CV. What's in a CV? What does it look like? Um, um, how do I make it effective? So we're going to start with a myth, just one today. My accomplishments will speak for themselves. The format of my CD is not important. <laughs> and I would say that um, just like the arguments we made for abstracting and your aims page of your proposal, those are your first impression to your committee, to your employer. A resume is also the first impression. You want to make sure that it's clear, polished, free of typos, you want to give a good first impression. So remember that a CV or resume is a kind of a way to sell yourself to your audience. And that audience, of course, can be your thesis committee. That's what we're preparing you for, for, for this class. But it could be a funding agency. It could be an employer. Um, you really want to um, put your best face forward when you do this. Um, when you make the CD. So creating a well-constructed and clear CV will be an asset in your career and you should start making a clear CV now. You wanna see what you have yet to accomplish so that you can be proactive about accomplishing those goals in your CV. All right, there are two basic kinds of professional records that you guys should be familiar with. 
the CV, which stands for Curriculum Vita, or the resume. And these two types of professional records are very different, but they have a lot of commonalities. So I'm gonna talk first about the differences and then about the commonalities. So just to give you a little bit of history, the Curriculum Vita, or CV as we call it, is actually derived from the Latin word course of, li course of life. So as the name kind of suggests, this is a, uh, a, a document that records all of your career, your the career life, I guess. It should have, there's no page limit. It's a complete listing of all of your accomplishments. It typically is used in an academic setting. And so that's why I have discussed this module as making an effective CV, because your candidacy exam is an academic meeting, you're going to write a CV and not a resume for this. Um, so oftentimes, because a CV is typically used in an academic setting, these are, tend to be used for applications for academic positions, fellowships, grants, and in your case, gaining PhD candidacy, okay? Um, this tends, this CV tends to be something, uh, some, mostly a longer document of the resume. So the resume tends to be a shorter document. And resume, of course, is French for summary. This tends to be a short document, the one to two pages, but short and concise is good for a resume. It's just to give a quick overview of you and your career. Um, the emphasis should be on skills. And the important thing here, you shorten it to make it customized for that particular situation, for the job interview, for the um, uh, internship, whatever you're applying for. So um, typically resumes are used in an industrial setting. Um, that could be in the public sector or the nonprofit, but it's basically to give a very busy person at, an, at a company a quick view of you so they can see if you'd be qualified for the job. Okay. These are the two basic kinds of professional records that we'll talk about and that you should be very familiar with as you proceed through your careers. I do wanna mention two more kinds of professional records that we in academics have to deal with and that has to come with funding. So it turns out NIH and NSF have very different styles of professional records. The NIH calls it a bio sketch and it's a very kind of concise version of what they want to see. It includes education, oops, sorry about that. It includes your education, your honors, your positions, your scientific accomplishment. And in the case of NIH, they wanna see your funding. Um, there also includes a personal statement um, we are not going to write a bio sketch here, but if you choose to apply for a fellowship um, through NSH, NIH or NSF, I want you to realize that these are a little bit different. NSF style professional record is called a biographical sketch. I know the names sound perfect, almost the same, bio sketch, biographical sketch, but they are different. The CV, uh, the biographical sketch for NSF um, is focused on these three things, professional preparation, appointments, and products. It also as the N includes synergistic activities and that's because the NSF really wants to see its scientists involved in outreach to the community. So um, the NIH and NSF have very different missions and therefore their, their professional records tend to be a little different. I'm not gonna belabor this. We are not asking you to write an NIH biosketch or a NSF biographical sketch. We want you to write a CV, but um, I want you to know that they exist and I've given you the links there if you're interested in looking and learning about them, especially if you're planning on applying for an NSF or an NIH fellowship um, um, in your graduate career or, or beyond. Okay, so regardless of the format of the professional record, CV, resume, or one of these, um, one of these uh, funding agency specific formats, all of the professional records for sure include these three things. They always include contact information. If you don't have contact information, we don't know how to get a hold of you, right? So if you get the job, you look, they say, oh, your CV looks perfect, but they don't know how to get a hold of you. That's a problem. Make sure that the phone number, the address, the email address you use are the ones you want to use for professional contacts. If you don't want people um, using your Gmail account, you prefer them using a uh, Hotmail account, pick the right one, okay? Um, education, be sure you list each name of the school, the degree you earned, the date, um, and uh, the graduation date or the expected graduation date. Obviously, you're going to put expected graduation date for your PhD because uh, that will be in the future. 
And then the GPA, if appropriate, in the case of you know, your candidacy exam, I'd say it would be appropriate. Rele relevant experience. And so this can be, depending on the job you're applying for, depending on the situation, you would put the job, the name of the company, the, what you did in that, the duties, the accomplishments. So this is a really way to highlight the skills that you earned um, um, particularly in a, relevant, in a resume for a company, okay? So these three things are in every type of, of format. So what I wanna do is, because we're gonna focus on CV, I, um, um, our advice is to present a CV to your candidacy committee. Um, we would like to talk about additional information that would be included in your CV. So in addition to contact information, education, and relevant experience, it would be appropriate to put any publications or um, presentations you've given, posters, oral presentations. At this point, this is probably from your undergraduate time, but um, if you're dissatisfied with the number of publications or presentations you have in your resume or your CV at this point, that's of course motivation for you to get in the lab um, and be successful and, and publish those papers and get out and give posters. Any honors and awards you got as both an undergraduate and as a graduate student. Teaching experience will be important for um, a job that's oriented towards teaching, but for the candidacy exam, we just love to know what your experience is. So please include that. And then if you've had jobs um, or, I mean, excuse me, if you've had affiliations with um, different um, professional organizations like the ACS, um, you wanna make sure that that's in your CV. Okay. So I thought we would do is go through um, an example, actually two examples of CVs. I wanted to give you two because I felt like this is what we're uh, wanting you to do. So I wanted to give you some um, variety of, of, um, of CVs. These, this one was taken from the uh, University of California at Davis. They have a nice site with a bunch of example CD, CVs. Um, in this case, the CV that I'm showing here, this is just an example, it's a theoretical person, um, but in this case, they have education, research experience. Um, and that, in this case, they, they, they put research experience right after, a teaching experience right after research experience, publications, abstracts, presentations, academic service, professional affiliations, research grants, and honors. So the, maybe the value of a CD is just sort of what order you put it in, what makes sense to you. And again, you wanna be thinking about who you're appealing to in the CV when you make those decisions. Um, so in this case, they really wanted to highlight their experience, which is why they put the research and teaching experience first. And I think that would be reasonable for your candidacy exam. You see the, the contact information is up here where they give an address, um, uh, phone number, um, and um, any kind of, um, they have a LinkedIn site here, which is fun. Um, you can see they have their education. I actually truncated this a little bit just to make it fit the page. They also show some research experience with the dates and where they had that and then kind of an overview of what they did in that research experience. In addition, they had teaching experience, publications. You can see they were able to give a poster at a, um, a meeting. Um, they have here academic services. So maybe in addition to their normal roles, they added, they did some other kind of synergistic roles that would show leadership. Leadership is something every employer is looking for. So if you have the opportunity to be the leader in your lab as a group job or be involved in the universe, the department in a leadership role, the safety officer, please take advantage of those opportunities to build that resume. Professional affiliations for us, it would be something like the American Chemical Society. Um, research grants, um, this of course will be appropriate if you were applying for a grant. This is maybe not a, criteria you would need for your candidacy exam, and then any honors. And to me, honestly, I put honors a little earlier. I think it's de-emphasizing honors if it's kind of later in the resume, but this is a perfectly acceptable way of doing it. Uh, remember, you guys ask me any questions as we're going through these, if you have any questions about thinking about what you're gonna do when you write your resume, or your, excuse me, your CV, please, um, uh, you know, ask me any questions that you have as, as you're thinking about this. Okay, so let's do one more of the CV because this is the format we'd like you to to um, to use for your candidacy exam. In this case, the CD, I chose this one because it's a little bit more concise. It's a little shorter. And they really emphasize here um, only their education, their some of their experiences and their publications and presentations. And that's going to be something, I think, more like what you guys will do. In your case, you, you may or may not have grants or fellowships, but 
for this particular applicant, showing that she was competitive and getting grants and fellowships was clearly important to get this particular job. So, um, but you may not have this part. Anyway, um, you can see they have the personal information, including email address. In this case, it's just one address and um, one phone number. Their education, this is of course a theoretical example, so it's giving kind of, you know, University X and College Y. But you can see that they have information about the, those universities, um, what degree they earned, what their thesis was, where, when, how, and why. That's kind of what we want to have here. Again, again, grants and fellowships, I don't see you guys having that in yours, but you would list them and put the dates. Teaching experience, I think you absolutely should put in your CV um, and you would just talk about each of the classes you were involved in, maybe who you taught with because that would be relevant for our department and what your responsibilities were, any publications you had, and again, if you have any publications, those would be from undergraduate years probably at this point, but if you have any, please put them in. If you don't, make that a motivator for you to get in the lab and be productive. Presentations also, these would be poster sessions, oral talks that you would give at conferences. Um, so you wanna again be um, you know, thinking about whether you need to build that up in your CV. And then any kind of professional experiences, if you did um, undergraduate research and your undergraduate institution, that would go under professional experience here. Okay, great, I have a question. How many pages do the CV have? There is, it's very much up to you, it's unlimited, and this is supposed to be a complete view of your career. So they can get actually quite long. In your case, um, customize, so my advice would be to customize the CV to the situation. I think for your candidacy exam, you should probably list everything you have. And so I would imagine at your career stage, maybe a page or two would probably be what I would expect. Maybe just a page. It's okay, you guys are at the beginning of your careers. Does that answer your question? Anyway, keep them coming, keep them coming. So it can really be as long as you want. Just make sure that the sections you have in there are relevant. If you have honors, please put in your honors. If you have any um, professional experiences that maybe aren't in the lab, but really relate to your communication or your leadership skills, feel free to add those. Generally, we would emphasize the things you've accomplished from the undergraduate years and up. We don't usually, I no longer put anything in from my high school years. So think about including any kind of experiences and education from your undergraduate years and following. Um, so uh, I probably wouldn't do your high school stuff, but other than that, that's about, um, you know, you can put everything you want. Another question. Um, there's no ACS chapter at Wayne State Chemistry for graduate students, as far as I know. I may be wrong, though. Yeah, the, the chapter of ACS that we have here is the undergraduate chapter. That doesn't mean you can't be a member of ACS and pay the dues and um, benefit from the newsletter that they put out. I'm a member of ACS. That would be my affiliation. Um, I'm also a member of the organic division and the biochemistry divisions of ACS, so I get new newsletters from them. So you don't have to be involved in the Wayne State chapter to have that affiliation if that's you know, something you're interested in. I have to admit, I became a member of ACS about your age. And I really loved getting that CNE News subscription. I think it's really interesting. They have lots of news highlights. I, I kind of liked it, but, but it's up to you. I mean, it is, um, in the end it is, I think at the student membership, it still costs money, so you can make that decision. Okay, keep the questions coming. I'm gonna move on to resumes just so I can get through this and we can get through um, to the rest of our class. Um, but um, a resume, again, is going to be kind of a shortened version of a CV. Um, oh, I see, so, um, so uh, the question is, would you put the ACS division you're a part of in, or just ACS? No, I would put ACS and then my divisions. I would put it all in there. But I mean, it's up to you. It's kind of your CV, you could do what you want. Okay, a resume, I'm only gonna show you one of these. It's, um, um, it's a truncated version. I think it looks a little more stylized. There's usually lines and pretty, I mean, there's maybe even colors in it. You wanna make it a little bit more blingy. I don't know what the right word is. You wanna make it a little bit more exciting, okay? Typically a resume will start off with sort of a goal statement or a skill statement, something that lets the employer, the person you're going to, really see your goal and your credentials very quickly. So you can see in this case, they have a professional summary. If you're applying for an internship or a job, you might say your goal is to find a job in blah, 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 right? 
Um, typically, you will do education or experience next because that would be the most relevant for your job application. And you can see they have education here. Presentations, um, work experience. I would probably put work experience a little higher here. Uh, memberships and affiliations. And then I don't know. Um, so they have related work experience and additional work experience. Maybe related work experience would be directly related to the job where additional experience would show leadership potential. So again, you can kind of um, customize this for the job opportunity and your particular career accomplishments. Okay, that's what I wanted to talk about in terms of the examples. Let's talk about what you are going to do. Your job um, by Monday is to create the first draft of your CV. So these are the steps that I would take for that. First, start by listing all your relevant information from your career, your education, your contact information, experience, publications, presentations, honors, anything that you think would qualify. Just make a list of it. Get it in your mind. Then now knowing the list, you want to formulate that CV and kind of put everything in order that makes sense to you. Okay, and think about the job or the application. In this case, it's the candidacy exam. You're appealing to a bunch of professors. You probably want to put your education and your research experience first, because that would be something we would like to see. Other little, um, other little tips, try to do reverse chronological order. We want to see the most recent experiences first. Please use consistent verb tense. Don't switch from, you know, it should really be past tense in most cases, but don't switch between them because it's confusing. And I personally think that there should be very little, if any, personal information. I wouldn't put your personal address. I would put the address of the university. And I see a CV sometimes with hobbies. I just don't find that necessary in a professional CV. CV. On the other hand, if the hobby somehow shows a multidimensionality to your personality that you think would be helpful, um, include it. But make sure you put in personal information that's appropriate for that particular um, opportunity. And then finally, please, please, please proofread, proofread, and double, double proofread. Because there's nothing worse than having a typo in your CV or resume and your employer seeing that typo and saying, this guy is, this person is not meticulous. I'm not going to interview them because of a typo. I mean, right? That sounds terrible. So double check. And then also double check and make sure that you thought about the opportunity and that it's appropriate for the CV. We have a question from Sarah. Yeah, yeah. So I see actually two questions. One is, should we put a picture in the CV? Uh, no, I would say no. It is not relevant what you look like. And it's personal information. And I would call it personal information. So I have never, never in my career put a picture of myself. It's a custom to do it in Europe, but not in the US. Yeah, I don't know. So, I mean, if you would like a person to see your beautiful face, I'm sure they wouldn't mind, but I, I guess I've never thought it relevant, so I never did. But anyway, that's my opinion. Apparently they do it differently in, in Europe and maybe other countries. Um, that's, so that's my opinion. Um, should, can we include skills? Yeah, for sure. So the question is, can we include skills like, I know how to do Microsoft and Java and Excel? Absolutely, especially if you think those skills would be relevant to the employer. Uh, right now, for your candidacy exam, whether you know how to use Microsoft Word or Excel maybe is not as relevant. We can probably tell by your documents you submit to us. But for an employer where um, uh, writing and communication skills are important, yes, yes, yes. Um, is there a need for a cover letter? Oh, good. Cover letters are yes. You definitely need a cover letter if you're applying for a job. Um, for a candidacy exam, you're not applying for a job. You're just hoping to get into the PhD program. So you don't need a cover letter. But if you're applying for a job, a cover letter is absolutely important because it allows you to introduce yourself. I would say a cover letter is composed of three parts. The first is, here I am. This is my name. This is where I come from. The second is what uh, I would gain from your position if I was to have it. And the third paragraph is what I would bring to the position or you can reverse those orders. But you definitely want to have what I would get from you and you would get from me, and that's, I think, a good cover letter, OK? Um, related to that, um, let me say that the Wayne State University, Wayne State University has a career um, services um, cent a career serv services center, and they give workshops all the time. And in fact, the next resume writing workshop is next week on June 25th. 
they seem to be giving these all the time right now. So if you want to know what's in a cover letter, if you want to know what's in a resume, please take advantage of these, um, these, um, online, these online events so that you can um, learn more about them. Okay, and then here's some references for you to take advantage of, including I put in here the career services um, from Wayne State. So uh, please take advantage of um, all these resources as you're, you're developing that CV. Um, so just to, to wrap up here, homework 11, which is due on Monday before class at 5.30, is to write a first draft of your professional CV. Again, it doesn't have to be perfect, but get all the information down there so that you can be perfecting it as you go through your careers um, and obviously before your candidacy exam. Um, great. Thanks for all the questions, you guys. I really appreciate the engagement. Um, keep them coming because I can still an answer them later. But for now, I think I will shift um, the lecture over to, um, to Ed and he can talk to you guys about, um, um, he can 